Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you for your patience. My name is Steve Inskeep. I'm co-host of Morning Edition from National Public Radio. Uh, and I'm extremely honored and privileged to be up here with uh, these three guests. Uh, I, I have a feeling that they are familiar to you all, but I'll say briefly that Abbas Malani has a distinguished academic career stretching back to the University of Tehran and continuing through today at Stanford University and is author of a book called Eminent Persians. Gary Sick uh, was in the National Security Council in the Ford, Carter, and Reagan administrations and has therefore had the opportunity to be frustrated by the problem of Iran as long as anyone in this room, perhaps. And Not quite, but almost. Oh, <laughs> almost. And probably, Car probably takes the prize. There, of course, he knows who might be further on in that category. Kareem Sajidpour of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where we are now, of course, and also previously the International Crisis Group, uh, and someone whose advice I've uh, relied on quite a bit over the years. Uh, the occasion for this, of course, is the anniversary upcoming of the 2009 election, although it is, of course, also a newsworthy week when it comes to Iran. Our friends at the New York Times tell us that American officials have been giving briefings to other members of the Security Council about Iran's nuclear program. We are going to have a somewhat wider ranging briefing today and talk a little bit about the political situation in Iran as we understand it. And perhaps we'll begin with Mr. Malani. I'd like to ask this question, Mr. Malani. It seems like a simple one. So much has happened over the past year, and yet we could argue that nothing has changed in Iran, despite all of the activity of the past year. What, if anything, has changed in your opinion? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation. I'm very honored to be here. Th uh, Karim Sajjadpur especially. I owe him a uh, word of gratitude. Uh, I think something has changed. I think uh, something fundamental has changed in Iran. Uh, I think last June 12th, a new Iran was born. Uh, the old Iran, uh, the status quo ante, is dead in my view, but it has a lot of poison in it. It has a lot of ability to do harm. It has continued to do that, and it continues uh, not because uh, it is a thriving uh, option or because it has answers to Iran's serious fundamental economic, social, demographic problems, but it survives because there is no alternative, and it survives because uh, it becomes an uh, inadvertent recipient of good fortune if in there, the region. If you'll forgive me, if there is uh, no alternative, then what is the new Iran that you refer to? Uh, th there is no alternative in the sense that no alternative has yet been powerful enough to take this uh, rather uh, uh, morbid phenomena and replace it. There is a democratic alternative. Uh, I think we are in a stage of uh, what, for lack of a better term, we can call the political purgatory, where there is a viable democratic alternative, but that democratic alternative is not strong enough, is not willing to challenge the regime, and the regime is not willing to give up. It is armed. It has uh, access to lots of finances. Um, I don't think, uh, I certainly know of no time in Iranian history where the democratic discourse and the social basis of democracy have been as strong. And I also n know no time in the last 500 years of Iranian history where as much as t it is the reality today, a military junta like the IRGC has become a veritable economic political juggernaut. Uh, these complexes, these conflicting uh, points of views or realities, in my view, uh, make for the complexity that is modern Iran today. I want to bring Kareem Sajidpour into the conversation. Kareem, I think we have spoken in the past about the Green Movement, the opposition movement in Iran, and what it stands for, and whether they all know and agree on what they stand for. Is there a new Iran, and if so, what is it? Um, <clears throat> uh, first, uh, thank you all for, for coming very much. Thank you to the panelists. Um, I, I agree with Abbas. Uh, if there was one sentence I have to choose from to, uh, to describe the events of last summer, it was from the late Grand Ayatollah uh, uh, Montazeri, who said that the Islamic Republic of Iran is no longer Islamic, nor is it a republic. Um, and I think that um, there was a, a day for me last summer, June 15th, three days after the elections, when it was the 
largest protest day. And uh, that was uh, a day in which the way I view Iran fundamentally changed. Um, according to some estimates, there were three million people. This is according to the mayor of Tehran, Mohammed Baghir Ghalibar. Three million people uh, showed up onto the, onto the streets that day. Uh, in what is my mind, one of the largest spontaneous protests, not only in contemporary Middle Eastern history, but contemporary global history. And to carry out a protest of uh, three million people, to do it uh, nonviolently, um, silently, um, is, in my opinion, uh, 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 a, a signal of the tremendous uh, maturity of, of the Iranian people. So for me, the way I, I, I view kind of the Iranian public, and if I had any lingering doubts about the Iranian public's readiness for democracy, they were eliminated that day. Uh, but certainly when you're faced against uh, a government which has an abundance of oil revenue and a tremendous will to remain in power and a monopoly of coercion, um, it's going to be a very difficult process. And I think that there was another fundamental lesson which I learned in the aftermath of the elections and the subsequent months, which is that when your only strategy is street protests, when street protests are the only play in your playbook, what matters then is not what percentage of the population supports you, but what percentage of your supporters are willing to go out and sacrifice their lives for that cause. And I think by virtue of the fact that the Green Movement espouses democratic ideals, uh, tolerance, nonviolence, a far lower percentage of them, a far smaller percentage of Green Movement supporters are willing to go out and, and, and die and kill uh, for this cause, as opposed to uh, government supporters who do have a monopoly of coercion and have shown themselves very willing to kill to stay in power. Do you mean that if it was a harder-edged opposition movement with a harder agenda in effect, that it might actually have been more successful? Well, I don't want to talk about it in the past tense because I think we're continuing to move forward. But, but certainly I think there's, there's several outstanding challenges which uh, the leadership of the Green Movement faces. And, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be critical of opposition uh, 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 candidates and opposition leaders, Mir Hossein Musavi and Mehdi Karbi. Um, but I, I think they also deserve due credit for... Uh, not relenting. Uh, you know, we oftentimes forget that up until June 12, 2009, there were regime insiders. For 30 years, there were regime insiders. And suddenly, overnight, they're thrust into these roles of opposition uh, leaders. And they're operating under incredibly difficult circumstances right now, uh, under virtual uh, house arrest. All of their communication is being monitored. Uh, Musavi's nephew was uh, uh, brutally murdered, Karabi's son was savagely beaten. And I think under those circumstances, it's going to be very difficult for them to um, organize a, a strategy moving forward. So in, in my mind, I think one of the first steps that has to be taken is um, that they're going to have to uh, uh, send trusted advisors outside the country to operate. They're certainly not willing to um, leave the country themselves, which is understandable. Um, but I think if you really want to begin to organize something serious and, and coherent and strategic, uh, it's going to be very difficult to do that uh, from within Iran. I want to bring Gary Sick into the conversation, and I wonder if we can try to look at this from the regime's perspective, because Abbas Malani has talked, you've used the phrase military junta, you've talked about the increasing strength of the Revolutionary Guard. You, Kareem, have talked about oil revenues, which are strong, strengthening once again. You've talked about coercion, some of the tools the government has been able to use. What, if anything, has the government lost over the last year? Well, first of all, <clears throat> it's a real pleasure for me to be here today, and uh, I can't tell you how many old friends are in this room, uh, some of whom I haven't seen for a very long time, others I've seen more recently. Uh, I hope some of you will get up to New York once in a while. It would be nice to maintain uh, eye contact a little bit. Um, in answer to your question, Steve, and I appreciate also your getting out of bed at uh, whatever it is, 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, so that you could be here on time, uh, uh, <laughs> you and Deborah. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, 
the things that I think have changed and that I think are really fundamental is that the very nature of the revolution itself has changed. And in the old days, the old days being in Khomeini's day and, and shortly after the revolution, the, the regime trusted the street. They are the ones that put on demonstrations. They are the ones who got people out. They are the ones that had millions of people marching in the street. Today, they don't dare. When you had most recently uh, Khomeini's uh, uh, commemoration, they had to keep it very tightly organized in one place. Nobody else could get in. There were no other demonstrations anyplace else. Anybody who showed the slightest signs of disagreeing with the way it was done, like the grandson of the Ayatollah himself, uh, was heckled uh, to the point that he couldn't even speak. Uh, they, when we have the, when the real the uh, the commemoration of the revolution of the uh, of the election last year comes up, you can bet they won't allow anybody on the street at all. Uh, these events are now passing either with highly choreographed events or they are actually preventing anybody from doing it at all. Uh, they don't uh, trust elections anymore. Uh, who gets elected is no longer a factor. That they, they want to determine who runs, and I think the number of people who will be allowed to run in any is going to be extraordinarily limited by the time we get to the next election. They used to respect the ulama, the high-level clerical people, and that was very much part of Khomeini's uh, beliefs that you should pay attention to the clerics. Today, you have a tiny little group of clerics at the very center who are pretty radical and who don't really represent the clerics of Iran, but they are the ones that are dominating the issues, and anybody who doesn't, dis who doesn't agree with them is silenced again. So you had even uh, Ayatollah Montezeri as the classic case, but there are many, many others who are simply not permitted to speak out at all. And then... In the old days, Khomeini said that the military shouldn't participate in politics. They have just turned that on its head. The military today is politics, and that's where it's coming from. So all of these things which define the revolution in its uh, origins are no longer true. Let's go back to Abbas Malani on that last point, because you used the phrase military junta. What did you mean by that? Uh, I, I meant precisely that uh, the IRGC is now controlling minimally about 60% of the economy. Over the last three months alone, they have gotten their hands on close to $20 billion of no-bid contracts. Uh, they are now- Thanks for what, if I may ask? Contracts for the construction of everything from oil and gas fields to the billions of dollars of construction that the regime is undertaking in everywhere from uh, Latin America, right here in uh, Venezuela, they just finished building 20,000 houses in Venezuela. In Africa, they're spending millions of dollars to fight Israel uh, vote for vote in the international community. All of this is being given in no-bid contacts to IRGC. The IRGC uh, runs virtually the economy. Uh, and they are, in my view, in, the, in that triumvirate that became the dominant force in Iran, the triumvirate of Khamenei, Ahmadinejad, and the IRGC commanders. They are the ascending force. I just want to add one point to what uh, uh, my friend was saying, and that is that I don't think the nature of the revolution has changed. I think the nature of the revolution is being revealed, and I think the coalition that brought the revolution to power has now frayed and has collapsed. Ahmadinejad represents the element, the hoodlum element, the street hoodlum element that was part of the coalition that Ayatollah Khomeini formed. And um, just as much as Musavi was part of that coalition, as much as Rafsanjani was, as much as uh, uh, I was, as much as the bazaar was, now uh, that radical fringe of that coalition is trying to get rid of everybody else and is trying to dominate, their, have the IRGC in their hand. Even the point of going after the clergy, let's not forget, it was Khomeini who put Ayatollah Shariat Madari under house arrest 
brought him on television and had one of the most shameful moments of Iranian history where they had an Ayatollah of Shariat Madari's stature come and repent in the most odious Stalinist manner. Let's not forget that Muntaziri was derobed in the direct order of Ayatollah Khomeini. So attacking unfavorable Ayatollahs has been the name of the game in this town. They are just now doing it more brazenly, and the person that is doing it, Khomeini, doesn't have the uh, stature, and that's why he brought the IRGC in. I think that is the big difference. That raises, in my mind, uh, a crucial question. It may be hypothetical. If Khomeini wanted to change his country's policies, liberalize in the country, or cut a deal with the United States, would the Revolutionary Guard let him? Um, I think that the Friday prayer after the election, Khamenei had a choice. He could align with the remainder of that coalition, which does want normalized relations with the United States, or he could align himself with the lunatic fringe, the radical lunatic fringe. He decided to go with the radical, radical lunatic fringe, and they obviously are not interested in a deal with the United States. Part of the money they make is off the embargo. This is normalizing relations with the United States is you know, cutting into their billion dollar, billions of dollars illicit trade. So uh, I think he could have, and I think if the rest of that coalition <laughs> was together under one leadership, the IRG doesn't stand a chance, in my view. I want to mention to all of you that you're welcome to jump in. Uh, as, as Go ahead. Actually, I would like to just pick up on the, the point that Abbas makes. And, you know, I don't disagree that there were elements <clears throat> of the, what I called the new Iran, that existed very early on and have been there from the beginning. <laughs> I think it has been more systematic, more obvious, and you can take the position, yes, they have been revealed uh, to a degree that wasn't true before, but actually part of the old Iran, uh, the pre-election Iran, was that they wanted to remain concealed. They didn't, they didn't want their hand to show. And now they make no bones about it at all. It is out there. They do it quite openly. They may, you know, they turn off the internet. They send forces out. They arrest anybody who shows up who's carrying a banner. Uh, basically, and the thing is, the IRGC now is dominant not only in the economy. It obviously is the military. It has taken over the security services. It now runs the judiciary almost entirely. And it is actually the arbiter of the ideology. They are the ones who decide what is revolutionary and what isn't. And what is revolutionary today is actually coming down to be simply defined as the divine right of kings. That that, that concept, which was around in the early days, but which was not certainly formalized, you couldn't have an Islamic republic that, was, that had the divine right of kings. Basically, they've shed themselves of the republic idea completely, and that is, in fact, where they're at presently. And that, it seems to me, is a substantive change, even if you can find traces of it there before. Reem Sajapur. Um, <clears throat> I obviously would agree with Abbas and Gary that I think, what thing that one thing that happened last uh, June was that any remaining moderates or pragmatists were essentially purged from the Iranian government's decision-making structure. Um, so I, I joke that the color spectrum of this regime now ranges from pitch black to dark gray. Um, I think a good litmus test of that is Ali Ladijani, who is the Speaker of the Parliament. If you go back and read uh, the Western media, 10 years ago, Ali Ladijani was referred to as an arch hardliner. Uh, today, vis-a-vis -vis Ahmadinejad, he's a moderate or a pragmatist. Um, and, and certainly it's true that the Revolutionary Guards have really eclipse the clergy in terms of their economic clout, their political influence, uh, their running Iranian foreign policy and all the hot spots, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, the Levant, the Iranian foreign ministry is essentially irrelevant. And I think actually the seeds of this were planted two decades ago when Ayatollah Khamenei replaced Ayatollah Khomeini as supreme leader. Uh, we all know that he didn't have uh, the clerical clout of Ayatollah Khomeini. He always kind of governed from this position of insecurity. And because he didn't have the legitimacy of the mosques, the legitimacy of the seminaries, he had to uh, seek legitimacy in the barracks. 
Um, so, so that's why I thought that if, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the most succinct uh, uh, quote which now sums up the Islamic Republic is, is what Montezetti said. It's no longer Islamic, uh, nor is it a republic. If I'm not mistaken, the Revolutionary Guards were created to guard, in effect, Khomeini and his revolution because he didn't trust the army. You're saying it is now reversed. Yeah, uh, you know, I was um, reading um, uh, the famous uh, uh, Cold Warrior scholar George Kennan's uh, um, old X paper in Foreign Affairs in 1947, and he actually said the same about the Soviet Union, that the, the security forces that were established to protect the state have subsumed the state. And I think that's exactly what's happened in the case of the Revolutionary Guards. Now, I'm one of those who will continue to make the argument that if you look at um, power in Iran in the shape of a pyramid, that Ayatollah Khamenei remains at the apex of that pyramid. He remains at the top. Um, he is commander-in-chief of the Revolutionary Guards. He handpicks their uh, top few tiers of commanders. He shuffles them frequently so they can't establish their own power base. Uh, so certainly I think that if there is a patron-client relationship, he's uh, the patron. Um, but at the same time, given the fact that Iran is increasingly the security state, that um, um, uh, the revolutionary guards, not the clerics, are the ones uh, in charge, of course he's ceded enormous power and influence to the revolutionary guards. And, you know, especially if you think in the aftermath of the elections, the Revolutionary Guards can't come to him and say, there's three million people out on the streets of Tehran. We need to do X, Y, Z, etc. Uh, of course, he's going to say, do whatever you can. Do whatever you need to, to, to uh, 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 make sure this edifice doesn't crumble. And I think so many decisions which have made, been made the last year, it's him having to concede to the Revolutionary Guards uh, for his own personal security. I want to mention that in a moment I'm going to begin throwing this open to your questions. There's so much expertise in this room that I want to take advantage of it and we'll be inviting that. So have your questions in mind if you have them for our panelists. I want to ask all three of you though about one specific figure because you spoke about the narrowing of the ideological spectrum and the disappearance of pragmatists. Um, where's Ayatollah Rafsanjani mm -hmm. in all of that? Um, I, I have a, a, a piece forthcoming about the relationship between Raf Sanjani and Khamenei, which I've tentatively entitled Shiite Shakespeare, uh, because I think the relationship between these two men is quite Shakespearean in the sense that if you go back 25, 30 years ago, Raf Sanjani was Khomeini's confident, confidant. He was um, uh, Khamenei's kingmaker. Had it not been for Raf Sanjani, Khamenei would have never become supreme leader. And I think if you look at the Iranian revolution in three stages, um, if you, the first decade of the revolution was the decade of Khomeini. After Khomeini died in 1989, the custodianship of the Islamic Republic was left to two men, uh, Raf Sanjani and Khamenei. Uh, Khamenei was the ideologue, the individual who was going to remain loyal to Khomeini's vision for Iran, remain loyal to the ideals of the 1979 revolution. And Raf Sanjani was, was more of the wheeler and dealer, uh, the guy who could help thaw relations with uh, neighboring Arab countries, with the United States, help rebuild the economy. And there was a balance of power between them in the second decade of the revolution. I think what happened in the third decade of the revolution was that the rivalry between these two men uh, began to grow more pronounced. Their worldviews uh, uh, began to uh, uh, dovetail more. And I think that uh, Khamenei almost used Ahmadinejad as a bludgeon, as a, as a tool to essentially get, uh, get uh, Raf Sanjani out of the picture. And, you know, if there is a litmus test as to what Raf Sanjani's power is at the moment, um, it's the fact that his son is a flying Dutchman uh, in Europe and, and the Gulf, and he can't go back to Iran because there's a warrant out for his arrest. So despite the fact that Raf Sanjani um, still holds important positions within Iran, and I think there's two or three generations of uh, technocrats in the system who much prefer him to Khamenei, um, he's ceded enormous uh, authority. And at age 75, I'm not sure if he's coming back. Let me throw that same question to our other panelists, if you have views about Raf Sanjani, whose role was somewhat mysterious to many of us over the past year, and whose 
position now is perhaps a little mysterious. Uh, my guess is that we have not yet heard the Rafsanjani's last uh, state. If it is a Shakespearean play, the fifth uh, scene is yet to come. Mm -hmm. uh, Rafsanjani has, I think, enormous power within the IRGC command structure. Uh, uh, many of the people who are now commanders first made ranks when he was the commander-in-chief during the war. I think he has enormous power within the clergy. Clearly, uh, they, were, they have tried to remove him from his two key positions. They have been unable to. I think it is absolutely right that Rafsanjani uh, was sacrificed by Khamenei. In fact, in the election, I think the Ahmadinejad pick was essentially uh, a non-Rafsanjani pick. Uh, but uh, my, my guess is that uh, the fact that Rafsanjani, with his history of pragmatism or opportunism, whichever you want to call it, uh, he uh, walks a very, very thin line between these two. Uh, the fact that he has refused the offer made repeatedly in the last year to rejoin the foil, to rejoin the, uh, Khamenei, to me indicates that he does not think that, uh, that this combination that we talked about, this triumvirate, is a tenable combination. I think he is bidding his time. He might not be able to play his last hand. He might lose, in fact, but I don't think he has played his last hand yet. Does that mean that he still supports the opposition movement or simply that he's preserving his options for as long as he can? Uh, I think clearly he has decided that he must keep his uh, uh, line of communication to the opposition open. Uh, the fact that his son is flying around is partly because he can't go back but it's also partly because Sun wants to keep lines of communication to the outside opposition open. Uh, the fact that his daughter openly talked about last week that my father is part of the Green Movement, wants to be part of the Green Movement, and is unshakable in his conviction. All of these I don't think are random acts. I think clearly he wants to keep that option open. And the fact that he does so, to me, doesn't... Because some people say he's doing it because he has no other options. Uh, I don't think that that is the case. I think he could have uh, compromised with Khamenei had he thrown in the towel. I don't think he has thrown in the towel. Very sick. No, I don't think he's thrown in the towel either, but I <clears throat> do think that um, the Revolutionary Guard and Khamenei have basically stolen a lot of the assets that he had going for him. That basically his great strength was after uh, Khamenei died, he became the president, and he set up the, the Nizam, the system, and basically peopled it with all of his own appointments. And they were everywhere. They, so he was not just the president, but he had lines that ran into every piece of the bureaucracy, every level, all the way down. In many cases, reporting to him individually, not even through the, the system. That is pretty much gone. Uh, one of the big roles that Ahmadinejad has played, which I think has gotten less attention, than some of his more spectacular, uh, outrageous aspects, is that he has completely replaced the, the, the personnel at all levels, everything from the governors general of the provinces right down to the lower levels, the mid to lower levels of the different bureaucracies. That has eliminated one huge element of Raf Sanjani's strength that was there before. Also, you, you almost... If it's Shakespearean, you know, we you sometimes have to be a psychologist to really think about Iran, or almost, I guess, other countries are exactly the same way. But who is this guy? Well, to me, the one great characteristic of, of Raf Sanjani is that he has never been a bold leader. He would take a position, but he would do it reluctantly. The way he got everything done was maneuvering behind the scenes. He would pull strings, he would put all the pieces in place, and then he would let things happen. And he didn't have to step out in front and lead the troops. He's never been willing to do that. I don't think he's willing to do it now. And I think his day is over. That basically, he is not in a position now to pull those strings from behind the, the scenes, to really make things happen, and that he may make a move at some point, and he's still a formidable uh, power in, in, the region, in the system because just the jobs that he holds makes him a power. But I think increasingly 
the people on those committees that he belongs to and are less and less willing to cooperate with him and that his ability to pull strings behind the scenes are dramatically eliminated. And you know what's happened in the course of the Iranian Revolution? Again, and I take Abbas's point that it's not all at once, but basically there have been two factors. One, the legitimacy of the revolution started very, very high and has been declining ever since. It really has been coming down. And as the legitimacy came down, it was replaced with repression. And I would say that those lines really crossed last year at the time of the, of the election. That is when they took off the gloves and said, okay, forget about legitimacy, forget about those arguments of the Islamic Republic and all of that. Those are just slogans now. This is the regime as it is. And the and suddenly it became repression, and the legitimacy was actually almost irrelevant at that point. That is a place where Rafsanjani has a very difficult job to try to step in. Words that we've heard used for him include pragmatist and opportunist. It sounds like you would almost tend toward uh, words that are other sides of the same coin, such as cautious or noncommittal, or indecisive even, perhaps. I think it's just his style, the way he likes to get things done. And I think that the tools that he had available to him in the past, first as a leader of the revolution, as somebody who was dealing with it on the ground, organizing it for Khomeini originally, then later as the president, pulling the strings, getting Khamenei in, in the position of supreme leader, but he as president was in a position to manipulate events. Those were his strong points. Increasingly, if those things are taken away from him, those abilities to, the strings that he pulls, the strings have been cut, and I think it is increasingly difficult. But my point is that he is a sort of Hamlet character. Okay, let's be Shakespearean. <laughs> okay, that he can't make up his mind. Kareem, um, you know, Rafsanjani's role at the moment reminds me a little bit about uh, U.S. orientation during the Iran-Iraq War, and the sense that they didn't really want to see either side come out victorious. Uh, obviously, Rafsanjani despises uh, Ahmadinejad, and I think deep down he despises Khamenei as well. So he wants to see an end to the status quo. Um, that doesn't mean that Rafsan Jani wants to see the emergence of a uh, democratic, uh, secular Iran, because he would have a huge uh, uh, stake to lose uh, in the status quo. I think ultimately um, he would like to be supreme leader himself, maybe be supreme leader light. Um, so in a way he's going to continue to have... Uh, a foot in each world. He's going to, uh, you know, have his sons and his other family members um, uh, vow support for the Green Movement and wanting to weaken the government. Uh, but he's also going to have his weekly meeting with Khamenei uh, and to tell him, listen, if we want to uh, retain uh, the Islamic uh, Republic, uh, you're going to have, you know, I'm your only uh, crisis manager. I'll just end by saying that I, I know that um, Abbas knows this better than any of us uh, because he was, I think, in the same uh, prison cell with Rafsanjani before uh, the revolution. And uh, uh, Rafsanjani uh, wrote a book about a, um, you know, an eminent Iranian uh, uh, political called Amir Kabir. And he's very uh, cognizant and he's very concerned about his own legacy, his historical legacy. And Abbas may well be right that uh, at age 75, he doesn't want to be remembered for simply have, having uh, 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 died when he was down. So, so I think he still uh, has some tricks up his sleeve, and maybe he's waiting for the right moment to act. But the more he's waiting, it seems that um, um, the, the opportunities are, are, are fewer to him because he wields less influence than he certainly did last year. Um, I can't let that pass without following up since uh, it was just said that you shared a prison cell with Rafsanjani. What kind of a prisoner is he? Uh, I can tell you he was a very bad volleyball player. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I shared a cell, not just with him, it was a cell block. Uh, I was in Evin prison for six months under the Shah, and I told him Montazeri was there, Rafsanjani was there. Mahdavi Akani was there, Haqqani was there, Talegani was there, virtually the who's who of Iran's revolution 16 months before the revolution. And if you had told them at that time, when we were playing volleyball in cell block number one, that within 16 months they will turn over the country to you, they would have thought there's something fundamentally wrong in your head. The prison air has 
corrupted your mind. If the ball was flying toward Raf Sanjani, would he get someone else to return <laughs> it rather than do it himself? He virtually would. And uh, I really, uh, you know, there was, a, uh, I don't want to take, this has nothing to do with our discussion, but during those days, there was a big rift within the clerical establishment in prison, which was very small. The, something like 90% of political prisoners were leftists. Uh, and these guys were a very, very small part. And there was a big fight amongst them on what to do in terms of uh, daily uh, conviviality with the rest of us who they thought were unclean. I mean, they literally would not touch us because we were not uh, uh, clean. And Rafsanjani and Talagani and Montazeri were the only ones of this group that would uh, touch hand with us, play volleyball with us, uh, eat off the same uh, cup of, uh, uh, pot of tea, not cup of tea, a pot of tea with us. And uh, they were, uh, you could see even then that their metal was different than the rest of these guys. One other question before I go to your questions from the audience, because we've just heard this example of Ras Sanjani, who is described as being, yes, definitely part of the Green Movement, and also someone who would really like to be Supreme Leader himself. I'd like to broaden it out to the Green Movement more generally because a question that has been on a lot of people's minds for the last year is, do they know and do they agree on what they want? Um, I, I think there is consensus uh, in, and that consensus was in the main slogan that they used on that three million man and woman march. It was, where is my vote? And if you uh, deconstruct that, you really can uh, see the entire demand for a democratic revolution that has been in power, in play in Iran for 100 years. The 1979 revolution, that's why uh, I, I said what I said in, in, uh, about the revolution revealing its sense. If you look at Iran's history, the same coalition of forces have been together for 100 years. They have brought the constitutional revolution together, they brought Mossadegh to power. They brought uh, Khomeini to power. They brought Khatami to power. They have had one simple demand. We want popular democratic sovereignty. We want to be a modern nation like everyone else. And that has been thwarted. Uh, Khomeini, go back and read what Khomeini said in Paris days. Khomeini knew that this was a democratic movement. He put on a democratic show that was Shakespearean. Uh, he was uh, the Iago to the Iranian people, telling them what they wanted to hear, knowing exactly what people's vulnerabilities were. He said not a word about this Velayat e not one word. He gave over 100 interviews. One of my students just wrote a paper on it. Not one word about Velayat e so that coalition, that 100-year-old coalition, is stronger today than it has ever been. It's more numerous. Its democratic discourse is more polished. It has a bigger uh, outside force that can help it in Iranian diaspora. Uh, that's why I think what it wants is very simple. Where is my vote? I want to vote. I want not I. I want to vote. I don't believe in divine justice. For 150 years, uh, there was reference to divine power of kings. The monarchy died in Iran long before the Shah died. For 150 years before the end of monarchy, not a single monarch died peacefully enthroned in Iran except one, Muzaffaruddin Shah, who gave up the powers of the monarch and signed the constitutional decree. That tells you that the divine rights of kings as a concept is dead in Iran. And Khamenei and Khomeini tried to revive it, and tried to revive it even more than the uh, divine rights of kings. And they're whistling in the wind. That is a long lost cause. They might keep it for a while. They have the IRGC to do it. The people have said no. And that's what the democratic movement wants. Simple, where is my vote? Let me open this up now to your questions. I'll invite you to raise your hands, and you can go first, actually, ma'am, if you want to just stand up there. Yeah, you in the uh, blue suit. Yes, you. You seem surprised. Um, 
and if you'll just wait for the microphone to come your way, and once the microphone does arrive, if you will give your name and your position uh, for those who don't know who you are. Please. Uh, Robin Wright, U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, I'd be grateful if the three of you would look ahead for the next year. What are we going to be discussing a year from now? What are the flashpoints that might spark uh, new movement? Probably not on the streets given the security uh, forces, but is it the um, coming together of this removal of subsidies and sanctions and uh, uh, the economic mismanagement? Is it the nuclear issue? What is it that is going to, that is going to be the flashpoint that triggers the next round of movement in Iran? Forecast, gentlemen. Um, I, obviously, none of us know, and um, you know. I think we have missed major turning points in the past, and I think you would join us, Robin, as uh, <laughs> having missed a few turning points along the way too. You know, it's uh, you know the fact is the the next flashpoint uh, is the next flashpoint, and it it takes people by surprise. Uh, I don't think anybody expected this election to set off the furor that, in fact, it did, uh, and the reason for that is not because the election uh, was falsified, but basically that they did, they did it so blatantly and, and acted with such disrespect toward the people. Let's face it, the people that were running, I mean, Musavi, Karubi, are not wild-eyed people who were going to go out and, and, re and throw the system out. They were good, loyal people who wanted to reform the system from within. If the regime had been willing, the IRGC, I think, had been willing to accept that, uh, then probably not very much would have happened. They would have had a little bit of a problem the way they did with Khatami, that he would have, that, the, that Musavi or Karubi would have tried to do something, but they would have thwarted him, and that in the end, the hardliners would have maintained their control. They were not willing to accept even that. They were not willing to. And, and so having made that decision, you know, where they actually come out the next time, you know, uh, you know people, you know, this is, a, this is a movement without a leader. Musavi and Karubi are not leading this movement. They say so quite openly in their own statements. Uh, Musavi says, and Karubi too, says, I'm a follower. And basically, this is one of the, this is a strange movement that has been very grassroots, and I think it goes back to what Abbas is talking about, that you have people who have been believing in the idea of some kind of a democratic government or democratic uh, operation in, in Iran for many, many years, and they're there. A friend of mine said the other day, who lives in Tehran, he said, all of this talk about the Green Movement being dead is just nonsense. He said, if they allowed people to come out on the streets freely to say what they wanted to say, there would be three million people back out on the streets of Tehran. They're there. They're waiting. But you know, if the repression, I mean, let's face it, this could be a very long process. You know, Stalin suppressed a movement in Russia that was very powerful and sat on it for, you know, what, almost 50 years. So there's power does work. Repression does work. Whether Iran is going to be the exception to that rule or whether it's going to be another case of long delayed explosions coming much later, I certainly can't predict, and I don't think we can at this point. Reem Sajipur. Um, I think, uh, Robin, that um, the flashpoints are not going to be street protests, in my opinion. I actually think that the, the thing that I, I will be very interesting to see play out is this subsidy, uh, the removal of the, the subsidy legislation. You, you probably know that um, every year Iran, the Iranian government, spends about $90 billion uh, in subsidies for basic foodstuffs and petroleum and things like that. Um, it's, I, th I think it still is cheaper to buy a liter of gasoline in Tehran than a, a liter of bottled water. And um, there's for years been uh, deliberations and, and debates about removing these subsidies, and it looks like it's finally going to happen, or at least 20 to $40 billion worth of these subsidies are going to be removed, um, which I think is certainly going to cause a, a sudden rise in prices. 
And what they've uh, intended to do is to simply dole out um, uh, cash to people. And I think Ahmadinejad's logic was, why should we be subsidizing all Iranians? I could care less about uh, the middle class and upper class Iranians who don't support me anyway. I just want to uh, support my base, political base. And I think they did um, uh, surveys. Iranians were asked to fill out uh, um, surveys about their income. And voila, they found that 90% of Iranians actually need uh, uh, the subsidies. Obviously, people don't uh, necessarily a answer openly about their, um, their, their income. So it's going to be very difficult for them to um, target uh, these cash handouts. And I think it's going to cause rampant inflation. Um, so, so for my money, that's going to be one of the flashpoints. And in terms of the green movement, I think that um, to use a cliche um, reminiscent of the 2008 U.S. presidential elections, I think that Musavi and Karbi uh, need to do a better job of reaching out to Ali the plumber in Tehran uh, and to make it clear to um, uh, to make it clear to um, working class Iranians why they would be better off in a green Iran. I think that argument still hasn't been clearly and powerfully made the way that Khomeini uh, made it in 1979 and Ahmed Jad made it in 2005. And now, uh, this is also uh, a credit to their decency, uh, that they haven't uh, simply um, kind of uh, pursued the uh, politics of, of cheap ep economic populism. Uh, but I think a very strong uh, case should be made to people um, uh, why the economy is doing so poorly, to point out uh, the corruption and cronyism, and again, uh, uh, point out to, to uh, 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 labor unions and, and others uh, why they would be better off in, in a green Iran. And I think it's a, it's a tall order um, to organize these labor strikes uh, because uh, the, the labor movements in Iran are just as amorphous as the green movement itself. Um, but they're certainly uh, uh, discontented. Uh, and I think that... Um, um, it's, it's, it's difficult, but it's certainly not impossible to do. Uh, Abbas Malani, any forecasts from you? Well, I, my guess would be, if anything, if uh, one has to uh, bet on anything uh, becoming a trigger point, it would be the economy. I think uh, uh, many of the wiser heads in the regime know that this is playing with fire, to suddenly take out... $90 billion out of people's standard of living. That's basically what they're doing. And giving back 20 or 40 in terms of cash to their own cronies and, uh, and creating a smaller and smaller militarized but well-greased uh, minority is, I think, as Laurie Johnny knows, very much playing with fire. Uh, I think people forget that this bill for uh, ending subsidies was passed during the Khatami presidency. Khatami refused to implement it because he said, uh, with, without uh, Khamenei uh, behind my back, people will take me, uh, tar and feather me uh, if I have to take this much out of the economy. You need a big political base if you're going to s reduce the standard of living for people. Remember, 30 years past the revolution, the real buying power of average Iranian income is still not up to 1975 level. The failure of this regime in, the, in economic terms is astounding. In almost every economic indicator, Iran in 1975 was a competitor of Turkey, was on par with South, Af uh, South Korea. There are studies, there are the statistics are there. Look at where the Turkish economy is, look at where the Iranian economy is, and they had a $220 billion windfall. And nobody knows what has happened to this uh, money. So my guess is that if anything uh, can be predicted as a trigger point, uh, it, it is the economy. Just one additional point. That is, if anybody has tried to buy the lower classes or buy a, a constituency, it's Ahmadi Najat. He traveled all over the country. He passed out money when he went for these visits. And in the old days, not, not the old days so long ago, actually, whenever he arrived in a provincial town, the stadium was packed with people and, and it was a noisy place. I don't know if you've seen the videos of his latest appearances out in the provinces. It, they're empty. 
I mean, there's nobody in the stadium. There are people wandering around talking while he's speaking. It's, it's amazing. There is no enthusiasm, no support. And if these are the people who he's bought, he didn't get a very big good bargain for his money. I want to ask one follow-up question about that, because you have talked about the increasing power of the Revolutionary Guard. And if you talk about removing other sources of income in the country, is it possible that will simply make people more and more dependent on the guys who can still write checks? Well, I think that's part of the calculus that, uh, that I think the calculus that they seem to have is that they're going to uh, attend to the uh, machinery of suppression, which is not just the IRGC. They are about 140,000. There is at least a million Basijis who are now into the act. They are getting billions and billions of dollars of contracts and they are driving the Iranian private sector out. The Iranian private sector has been virtually destroyed during the Ahmadinejad presidency. I think by the end of it, it will be non-existent. And uh, the, the way they, they're structuring it, the Iran's chamber of equivalent of chamber of commerce has said that we won't be able to produce a damn thing with, these, uh, with this new economic setup. What they're counting on, in my understanding, the only thing that makes logic is as he suggested, they're going to say, hell with the rest of the people. We've got this group that can beat on the people and hold us in power. We'll keep them happy. Uh, hell with the rest. Let me move on to some more of your questions. You in front, ma'am. Go right ahead, please. We'll get it to as many as we can. I know there's a lot of questions. Please stand up and uh, introduce yourself also, if you will. Sure. Barbara Slavin, author. Nice to see all of you. Abbas, nice to see you again. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that both Karim and Abbas uh, mentioned, and that is the role of the diaspora. Both of you said that the diaspora was pivotal in this movement. Now, it has been in the past. Obviously, it was tremendously important in uh, 78, 79. How would you describe the role of the diaspora now compared to 78, 79? Um, it would seem that with so many people being forced to flee that this is a, a very clever tactic on the part of the regime to, you know, to marginalize the green movement. Uh, can there be organization done from the outside that will benefit those in? Thanks. Uh, Abbas, why don't you take that first? And, and in fact, I uh, just will ask my own question to Abbas on top of what Barbara said, because there was a, a quote I saw from you um, in, in one of the newspapers, which said that um, um, before the revolution, um, there was... Um, you know, uh, several thousand Iranians in the United States who really made life hell for the Shah. And how is it that Ahmadinejad can uh, come to the United Nations and give a speech and, and get out alive when there's a million Iranians in the United States who despise him? And two million, at least three million Jews who uh, have as much a complaint against them as they have against any president that has ever visited. And we haven't been able to mobilize it. I think that has been... Uh, a failure. I think the Iranian diaspora has uh, a very important potential role. It hasn't realized that p potential yet, but I think it is fast moving in that direction. And if it does, in fact, if this potential does, in fact, become reality, I think uh, it will be a major problem for the regime because many of the regime's key tools of suppression are going to be thwarted by, can be thwarted. Uh, if there is an organized diaspora, Iranian diaspora, as you know, in America alone is estimated to control $700 billion in assets. These are companies that they either own or manage. Iranian diaspora is arguably the most successful diaspora in the last 30 years to have come to the United States. They're disproportionately well-educated. They've been incredibly successful. And now, in the last five years, they've begun to pay attention to politics, and they're beginning to organize. And if they can, uh, you can basically become, a, the Iranian diaspora can become a virtual part of the Iranian civil society. What did the few thousand do in 1979 that apparently is not being done now? The few thousand students, uh, and I was uh, one of them, uh, uh, organized, mobilized. They were dedicated. They, they literally... Uh, I'm, I just finished a book on the Shah, and I was looking at the archives, uh, American archives. The Shah's movement in the United States was partially dictated by where there were concentrations of Iranian students. 
uh, his movement in Europe. I've looked at the British archive and the American archive. They wouldn't take him to certain places because they said there are too many Iranian students, we can't secure him there. Uh, he, I think, knows. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Make sure not to go anywhere where there are any Iranians. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, um, you know, Barbara, before uh, these elections, the, the nomenclature, and even now the nomenclature which the Iranian government um, uses is this notion of khodi and ghayr khodi, uh, insiders and outsiders. And there's actually a cleric who resides in Washington, D.C., who is an old friend of Khatami and a lot of the reformist clerics. And I saw him at a function last fall, and I said, well, um, we're all outsiders uh, now. You're now an outsider as well. He said, no, uh, the ruling uh, junta are, are the outsiders, and we're all insiders now. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that that uh, gap between um, uh, political activists in Iran and those in the diaspora, um, I I've never seen uh, it uh, as narrow as it is right now. And the links which have taken place over the last year are quite remarkable. Abbas and uh, myself personally have been in touch with uh, uh, people on a frequent basis whom uh, a year ago we wouldn't have been um, in touch with. I, I actually uh, uh, think that one of the um, potentially uh, divisive uh, themes um, which could come about in the ensuing months uh, between um, the leadership of the Green Movement and the younger generation of the Green Movement and certainly the diaspora Iranians is the legacy of Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, because for the leadership of the Green Movement, uh, or the nominal leadership, as Gary says, um, Musavi and, and Karbi, well, they still continue to revere Khomeini as this infallible icon. You know, had it not been for Khomeini, they would have never been in the positions they are. Uh, for the younger generation of Iranians, and certainly the Iranian diaspora, uh, Khomeini is the, is the problem, not the solution. Or Khomeini's ideals are the problem, not the solution. And I noticed over last summer that the regime uh, picked upon this as a, as a divisive issue. Uh, during some of the protests, effigies of Khomeini were burned, and it could have well been uh, uh, regime supporters themselves, because then Musavi and, and, and Karabi and others are forced to denounce it and, and praise Khomeini, which makes the diaspora Iranians very unsettled, that you know, these guys still are revering Khomeini 30 years later. So I think this is going to be um, a, a potentially divisive issue. I would just end on, on saying that I think there's a lot of caricatures of the Iranian diaspora to say, oh, they're all uh, monarchists or members of the Mojahedina Khalq, uh, when in reality of the four million Iranians or so that are in the diaspora, I would argue that you know, those groups probably encompass a very small percentage. And even a friend of mine who's in the audience today who is sympathetic um, uh, to the monarchists said, not even the monarchists are monarchists anymore. You know, not even people who are sympathetic to monarchy believe in an absolute monarchy. At best, you know, it's a, it's a constitutional monarchy. Let me move to the gentleman in blue here, and then we're going to go to the back. So if we can have a microphone ready, uh, ready in the back as we continue our discussion here. Um, Michael Cowan with Democracy International. Assuming China and Russia follow through on what they've sort of promised, how do you think substantive sanctions would affect the dynamic between the Green Movement and the current regime in the country? Gentlemen. Uh, first of all, that's a big assumption, uh, and I think a new factor that has been added to the regime's benefit uh, is the new surprising turn in Turkey's foreign policy. Uh, I think the regime has, be has been given a very big bonanza. Uh, I think the European decision not to accept Turkey will go down in history as one of the most strategically in my view, flawed decisions with consequences that we will see in years to come. And uh, so we now have to worry not just about China and Russia, but also about Turkey that is becoming increasingly belligerent towards the West and uh, uh, more inclined to see if it can make a pact with the Iranian regime. But my sense is that if the sanctions are smart sanctions uh, and target the regime, target the IRGC, uh, target the regime's ability to exercise uh, oppression, uh, punishes those who have been oppressing people, uh, disallows their tr ability to travel, for example, 
these will send uh, a very important uh, message to the green movement that the international community is on its side and is willing to bring the kind of a pressure that decreases the regime's brutality but does not hurt the Iranian people. When you said earlier that the IRGC <coughs> profits from sanctions, it made me wonder if sanctions are utterly counterproductive. Uh, uh, they have so far profited from it uh, because, first of all, they had this incredible windfall, and they set up something like 10,000 companies in Dubai where they would buy American products and bring it into Iran and sell it, and virtually the entire thing was in their hands. Uh, with money being less, they're going to have less of uh, this kind of a cash to throw around. Uh, and I think if it is targeted to them and their companies and their leaders, uh, it will send the right kind of a message. And I don't think Russia and China can long become the sole defenders of an absolutely brutal regime. Um, the, 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 new, <coughs> the full text of the uh, new sanctions uh, re resolution at the UN is now available online. Uh, I read it on the way down on the train. Um, it does a couple of things. First of all, it makes a nice little gesture, uh, a sort of pro forma gesture uh, toward the Brazilians and the uh, Turks and says, you know, that uh, good for you for doing this. And then the next sentence says, you know, but we've really got to focus on the, the big issues and with the implication being that that didn't do it. So uh, I'm not sure that Turkey and Brazil are going to feel terribly good about that. I, it was presumably that was added for their benefit uh, to the resolution. The real test of the uh, resolution itself is the annexes, which are not public. That is, who is named? Who in the IRGC is you're not permitted to deal with? Who can't travel? Which companies can't do business? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all in annexes that have apparently been circulated to the members of the Security Council, but not to us. So at this point, we don't really know what it would do. But I do agree very much that, to me, Sanctions are useful for one thing. They are useful to lever Iran in a direction. Iran does not like sanctions. They would much prefer not to have sanctions. If you, in fact, go ahead and impose sanctions, they'll live with them. But if you threaten sanctions with a clear uh, way out for Iran, and I think the Turkey-Brazil issue was exactly that. They saw the sanctions coming. They said, okay, let's, let's do a deal. Let's go back to where we were before, back in October, and we'll cut a deal uh, that basically will satisfy everybody. And we didn't like to do it then, but now we're prepared to actually do it. And what was the difference? There were sanctions coming down the road. In there, I, the, the U.S., I think, made a really, really terrible decision that instead of saying, oh, okay, let's talk to you about that, and not only what that deal is, but how you can go on from there. It provided an opening. But instead, we were all caught up in our sanctions passing business, as if the sanctions were going to somehow resolve the problem. They're not. When we started sanctions against Iran back in the mid-1990s, Iran didn't have a single centrifuge. Since that time, we have sanctioned them, and increasingly, new sanctions have been added through the Security Council, multilateral, et cetera. For, this is the fourth resolution by the Security Council coming up. Iran has 9,000 centrifuges and is producing low-enriched uranium. That's a, if you want a measure of what works, that should tell you something. I mean, it hasn't worked. What we've never tried to do however, is use the sanctions as levers or trading points that you could, in fact, get something else that you're looking for. And to me, that's the real tragedy of, the, of where we are today. That we could have done that. We still could do it, but it gets harder and harder, and the price goes up constantly. Briefly, Kareem Sajidpour. Yeah, the, the, I know the conventional wisdom is that UN sanctions are negligible, but I think your question was how will the sanctions affect the green movement. And I think that... Um, UN sanctions are much more politically consequential than they are economically consequential. To get China and Russia to endorse them, obviously, they water them down. 
Um, but I think they can be a useful tool to the leadership of the Green Movement uh, to make clear to the Iranian public that it's not only the United States and Europe which are sanctioning and isolating Iran. Uh, Ahmadinejad and Khamenei's foreign policy is isolating us from the entire world, uh, China and Russia and Turkey and Brazil. So, so I think that my experience over the last year is that sanctions have been arguably the most, um, the most contentious uh, topic among green movement activists. Plenty of people um, think that they would be counterproductive or hurt the people more than the regime. Plenty of people are forced to say that because they're based in Iran. Uh, but more than ever before, I've also had many people privately tell me that they now believe that sanctions are a necessary evil, that this regime has become a cancer and that sanctions can be chemotherapy. Let's go to the back of the room over here on my right, sir. Go right ahead, please. My name is Shahyar Etvinani. Uh, this question is for Dr. Milani and Karim. Um, with you know, a free, true free secular democracy being the goal of most of the Iranian people, uh, which by definition means an absolute end to the Islamic Republic, uh, what do you think are the key ingredients necessary for the Iranian people to achieve that goal? Well, let me take uh, first an issue with the way you put the question. Uh, I think over the last 150 years, one of the biggest lies that the clergy have told the Iranian people, and it's been very effective, is that secularism means an end to piety and religion. That the separation and change in state means lax moral or religious foundations. That's a big lie. The United States is the biggest example. There is secular society and there is a deeply pious society, probably the most pious of any modern nation. I think you can have a republic where people are as pious as they want to be. The difference is not whether there is piety or not. The difference is not whether people are Islamic or not. The difference is whether, the, the only difference, is whether the foundation for sovereignty is the people's will. That's the only difference. And if you have that, uh, I think you can call it anything you want. You can have a republic that is democratic and Islamic, but you cannot have a democratic Islamic republic, as you cannot have a democratic Christian republic. Religion, if it becomes the foundational idea of politics, it cannot be democratic, because democracy is based on pluralism. Democracy is based on the right of the other. Democracy is based on ambiguity, and religion doesn't allow that. Uh, so my hope is that we can have an Iran where people can be as pious as they want or as faithless as they want. People can practice Baha'ism if they like or shamanism if they like. Just don't get in my business. Don't tell me how to run my life. And don't try to base our country's laws based on shamanism. I just want to share a very brief anecdote from the days when I was based in Iran. About five years ago, I was going to interview a guy called Mustafa Tajzadeh, who was a, then a very close advisor to President Khatabi, and he subsequently spent eight months in prison in the aftermath of the elections. And um, I was um, driving to see uh, Tajzadeh, and for the first 40 minutes of my cab ride, the taxi driver was, was cursing the corruption of the clergy, which is, you know, anyone who's been to Tehran knows that um, that's the modus operandi of, of Tehran taxi drivers. And uh, a few minutes before he was about to drop me off, he asked me a question kind of apropos nothing, I thought. Uh, he said, uh, Mr. Karim, do you like uh, kharboze, which is a kind of melon? I said, sure, I like melon. He said, how about honey? Do you like honey as well? I said, yeah, I like honey as well. He said, well, you know, never eat the two of these together because it will create a, a, a rock in your stomach. So I assured him I would not eat the two of these uh, together. And then there was kind of a dramatic pause on his end. And he said, you know, Mr. Karim, uh, politics is melon and religion is honey. Uh, separately, both of these things are good. But when you mix them together, it taints the name of both politics and religion. And this wasn't from a uh, uh, Tehran University PhD. This was from a cab driver uh, with a high school education. And you would be very hard pressed to find a cab driver in Istanbul or Riyadh or Amman or increasingly New York City 
who would be able to uh, make that distinction for you. So I think that Abbas makes a very good point that, um, uh, and, and this is something which needs to be impressed upon uh, people that um, secularism isn't anti-religion. Uh, this gentleman himself was very pious, uh, but I think he, he learned uh, via evolution uh, and, and, and grassroots experience that, that when you mix piety and politics, you taint the name of both. What kind of tip did you give him? <laughs> I, gave him I actually gave him a hug afterwards. I was so happy, uh, uh, I was so happy to, to hear that. And what was interesting was when I went to go see Tajzadeh, who was really kind of the, one of the architects of the reform movement, I recounted this anecdote for him. And I said, this was before the 2005 presidential elections. And I said, you know, why don't you guys talk about not eating melon and honey together? And his response to me is that it's too soon to do that. People are going to think we're trying to take religion away from them. So this is a, this is a, a delicate uh, um, um, argument that needs to be made to people. And after you hugged him, did he hang around a moment waiting for his tip? Oh, wondering. of course I gave I'm him his curious. tip. Yeah. I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah. Did you have something you I'm wanted to add? I'm a good tipper. Okay. okay, we'll go right on. Continue on the back on the aisle there, sir. Please go right ahead. Steve Riskin, U.S. Institute of Peace. I had a follow-up question. It's good to see you all, by the way. It, I had a follow-up question on the IRGC. You know, we've heard about how uh, it has grown in stature in the military, in the economy, in politics, and it's become a, a dominant player in Iran. And I guess my question is, it, it seems to me it couldn't be monolithic. And my question is, what do we know about the leadership, uh, potential cleavages, uh, differences of opinion in, in policy or ideology, and what kinds of things might be useful for foreigners like the United States in informing policy toward the country? Uh, well, Steve, it's the question I think all of us would love to be able to answer. Uh, I certainly don't pretend to know the answer to that. I, I, I do want to remind you that the IRGC still remains in the background. They are, they're not standing up and, and, you know, sort of carrying out policy from day to day. They act through, I, I, I take exception, I think, to my two colleagues in that I think uh, that Khamenei and especially Ahmadinejad cannot countermand the IRGC, that they may go their own way, they may look independent, but in reality, I think the IRGC is setting the rules and they really have to follow those. And they may follow them because they want to or because they find it comfortable, but they follow them nevertheless. And I, the, but if you recall, at some point, the IR, let's say, you know, you know, Khamenei is not getting any younger and he's had his health problems. So what if in the next decade or the, even the next year he dies? I'm certainly not predicting this, but it, it does happen. And, um, it is, uh, what happens then? Uh, there's a possibility, for instance, that you would actually have the Revolutionary Guards emerging as a, openly, to sort of pr provide a leader, uh, whether they had a uh, pro forma, uh, you know, uh, senior leader or what have you. And I just remind you what happened in Egypt with the free officers. When they came to power in the 50s, nobody had heard the name of Nasser until after they got there. And suddenly, there he was. And he became the, the name of those people. I think the Revolutionary Guard is in very much the same status right now. Not that they are maneuvering to overthrow the regime necessarily, but it seems to me they are providing, uh, they are setting the base for what will happen later on. And there may be leaders emerging who actually are calling the shots inside, but we're not permitted to see that. And I think we probably won't know until the lid comes off and somebody stands up. And maybe they don't know the answer to it themselves until actually the moment arrives. Let's stick with Mr. Riskin's question for a moment. Are there signs of divisions in the Revolutionary Guard? Um, you know, anecdotally, there's a lot of signs. When I was based in Tehran, I used to act, interact with, uh, with uh, uh, revolutionary guardsmen who served in the Iran-Iraq war. And kind of the, an adage which I would hear a lot is that men who have served in war, war value peace more. Um, so there 
oftentimes far less ideological than their civilian counterparts, as we saw in the United States in the run-up to the Iraq War as well. Um, and, and we saw, I think in 2001, there was a lot of anecdotal stories that uh, three quarters of uh, one particular Revolutionary Guard barrack voted for uh, Mohammed Khatami, uh, not his hardline uh, opponent. And again, uh, I, 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 the Revolutionary Guards are kind of a black box in the sense that, of course, the, the uh, senior few tiers of commanders are handpicked by Khamenei. He shuffles them frequently, um, so they're loyal to him. Uh, but by all accounts, the, the rank and file is much more reflective of Iranian society uh, at large. And my own sense from talking to people, including one guy who was among the top uh, five, six commanders in the Revolutionary Guards up until a decade ago, I asked them what would happen um, if uh, the protests continue uh, at a large scale and the Revolutionary Guards are sent out into the streets on a daily basis um, to um, crush people who... Uh, voted for Musavi, just like many of them they, uh, did themselves. Um, would we see kind of an internal fight within them? And he said, uh, more likely they would just lay down their arms rather than fighting one another. Uh, they would see major uh, splintering and they, they would lay down their arms. And I, I thought maybe we were getting to that point last summer, but it didn't reach that point. Meaning that you don't see? I, I, I think that um, we'll see what happens. I, I think down the road it's certainly within... Uh, the realm of possibilities. But at the moment, um, the Revolutionary Guards are ruled much in the same way that the Iranian public is ruled, in the sense that um, the regime would prefer to be feared than liked uh, by its uh, 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 citizens. And I think the senior commanders of the Revolutionary Guards also instill, instill fear in their subordinates. Uh, I tend to disagree. I think there are a lot of empirical signs about these rifts. If you look for them in the right place, they're there for you to see. I specifically referred you to three websites. They're easily available online. They are published by three different uh, groups within the IRGC. Uh, one is Sopha Sadeq, it's the political organ of the IRGC. The other one is Top Knock. It's a website published by Rezaei for 18 years, the commander of the IRGC. The other one is Jahan News, published by the Intelligence Ministry of IRGC. You will see there is profound differences between these people. Rezaei was virtually siding with the Green Movement before they threatened him and he backed off a little bit. Look at Top Knock. Top Knock is a site which reflects Rezaei's views and I cannot believe that Rezaei is standing there alone without his 18 years in power having left him with some ally. So there is a lot of evidence that there are profound differences. Look at Ghali Baf. Ghali Baf was a commander of the IRGC. He is now the top critic of Ahmadinejad. I mean, it's the, the, the competition between Ghali Baf, Rezaei, and Ahmadinejad is not a joke. It's a very serious, constant uh, fight. And... Uh, Look at the commander of the IRGC whose son was killed in the Green Movement. Look at the letter he wrote to Khamenei. It was available online. And finally, there is an uh, empirical study that shows, uh, I don't know whether it's a reliable methodology, but it was a published study that showed 70%, as Karim says, these people live in Iran. They're not a different branch of uh, uh, humanity. 70% of them at least voted for Khatami in the first round of the presidential election. That shows that the rank and file is very much of a different... Uh, uh, and I just wanted to add one comment to what Professor Six said. Uh, I did not believe, I do not believe, uh, that uh, Khamenei commands the IRGC. If you remember, I said the opposite. I said in that triumvirate, the ascending force is the IRGC. I agree with you fully that they do... Uh, their thing, and the, the other two have to follow. I, I'm in the minority here that thinks that uh, Khamenei is, is still in charge. Just one brief anecdotal uh, point as well. Last summer, uh, something I heard from uh, actually family members uh, in Iran who um, some of them live in a neighborhood which is uh, predominantly inhabited by um, mid-ranking and low-ranking revolutionary uh, guardsmen, uh, apartment building. And they said at night the cries of Alu Akbar uh, you know, the anti-government uh, protests were, were coming quite loud um, from those apartment buildings. So I thought that was interesting. 
one quick question. When you look at those three websites, do you sense that you're seeing differences of personality from men who essentially believe and support the same thing, or are you seeing differences of policy and differences of opinion about the direction of the country? I think you see profound differences of policy. Uh, if you look at Top Knock, you see uh, a policy that uh, is worried about the private sector, is very much concerned about Ahmadinejad's economic policies. You look at Sope Sadeq, uh, I think that tells you what is coming in a few weeks ahead if you read their lead editorial. And the last lead editorial, incidentally, published last Monday, does not bode well for Rafsanjani because it was against directly Rafsanjani. It did not call him an Ayatollah or even Hujjatul Islam. It called him Agai Rafsanjani, which is extremely meaningful in the context of their uh, language. And it took him to task for republishing on his website the letter that he had written before the election to Khamenei. They said he has shown that he is still very much with the opposition, that he is a brain trustee of the opposition. There was no reason why for he should republish. Top Knock is very much in support of Rafsanjani. What was the, what's the translation uh, of the salutation that was given to, or the title that was given to Rafsanjani? Just Mr. Mr. Okay. Okay, next question. Uh, let's go over here, sir, if you would. Thank you. Henri Baki from the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, you, uh, Professor Milani, you talked about the IRGC essentially having taken over and being this is a junta. Given the relationship between Ahmadinejad and the IRGC, uh, and given the fact that he's, shall we say, term limited, as we call it here, do you see that they will try to change the constitution to give him another chance? And if they do, what will be the ramifications of that? Well, I, I would, uh, again, I go back to something Professor Gary Six said. He's, he talked about how Ahmadinejad changed much of the middle level. It is estimated that he changed 10,000 people in middle level ambassadorial, uh, undersecretary level. I think he shocked Khamenei by the sophistication of the network that he had amongst the IRGC commanders. Remember that he, one of his closest friends is the founder of the Quds Brigade. Uh, so he has a very, I think, uh, sophisticated network amongst the IRGC. And I would not be at all surprised if they try to do exactly that, because their model is Chavez. They very much emulate Chavez. Uh, they are increasingly in contact with him. Whether they will succeed or not, uh, I am not sure. Uh, again, I don't think Iran is Egypt 1952. Iran is Iran post the Green Movement. You can't have a Nasser come out of nowhere and take over an, a society that has been at this level of sophisticated, sustained democratic struggle. This is not uh, Afghanistan. This is not Iraq. This is Iran. This has a sustained movement. And the RGC, I think, if they change the Constitution, try to change the Constitution, I think they're fighting a very difficult battle. Um, uh, assuming Ahmadinejad lasts until the end of his term, which is 2013, um, I don't think he's going to go into his post-presidential life gracefully. I think Steve knows better than any of us. He did a wonderful interview with him that this is a man who uh, loves the limelight, he loves attention, and he loves power. And I've already seen some uh, um, kind of mentions of this on uh, hardline websites about actually um, reinstating the position of uh, prime minister uh, in Iran, a position that was abolished in 1989, and making Ahmadinejad essentially a Putin-type figure, um, and uh, to have uh, you know his his own Medvedev as well. So so I agree with that boss that I think um, they're really uh, uh, pushing the limits then. There, but but I don't think it's beyond them to 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 go for that option. Thank you for the taruf, by the way. I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. Um, if no one objects, we, uh, unless somebody feels differently, we should probably dispense with the closing statements we might have been thinking about and continue with questions. Sure. Is that please, okay with please, everyone? No. Let's get uh, two or three more questions then, if we can. Uh, the gentleman or uh, holding the notebook back there, yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, Michael Allen with the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, we understand that Khamenei personally commissioned a, a study of the, the color revolution, so-called democratic transitions, and they've clearly leaned from, learned from that how to frustrate democratic transitions driven by precisely the kind of street level mobilizations that Kareem rightly said the Green Movement became dependent upon. Is there any evidence that the Green Movement itself has gone through a learning process and that they are uh, diversifying their strategic repertoire, as it were? Are they using this period of relative quiescence to organize in communities, to reach out to labor unions, uh, as Musavi suggested? Gentlemen, any thoughts? No. Um, I, I, you're absolutely right. This is how uh, Khamenei describes um, these soft revolutions as um, the new model of colonialism, post-colonialism. Countries no longer are physically based uh, there, but they kind of control you from afar. Um, my own sense, and, and I hope I'm wrong here, and, and I'm sure that, that you know, so many thousand miles away from Iran, I can't see what's taking place, but I haven't seen a lot of signs of um, organization and strategic thinking taking place among the senior leadership. And this is one of the first points I made earlier, that it's very difficult to operate under those circumstances where you can't even say something to someone in the comforts of your own home uh, without thinking that it's being somehow picked up by a, a bug. Uh, so I think it's going to be very difficult for the leadership to, to organize something uh, strategic and sustained from within uh, the country. But, but, but I'm hope, I hope I'm wrong there. Let's keep going. Other questions? Uh, another man with a notebook. Go right ahead, please. Peter Pietetsky, Tehran Bureau. To what extent I'm sorry, say that again? Peter Pietetsky, Tehran Bureau. To what extent today do you think the government's decisions are being driven by institutional interests such as Dolomar or the IRGC or the whims of leaders such as Rafsanjani or Hamani or Ahmadinejad? Um, it's uh, an imponderable because I think all governments and all organizations have both mixed together. I guess the thing that concerns me most is that you have Ahmadinejad, who I do think came out of nowhere. He was not identified as a great leader or even as somebody that people knew particularly until he actually ran for president. He had been the mayor of Tehran, but you know, uh, nobody, he was regarded as a non-entity. And all of a sudden, he is not a non-entity anymore, and he has created this whole structure of support for himself and for his organization. And I think the two are bound together. Uh, without the IRGC, without the Revolutionary Guards, I think Ahmadinejad would be nothing at all. Could we call him dirt and dust? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, a phrase that he has made very popular recently. Uh, but the fact is that he has the organization. And the two work together. You have pride and you have ambition, and then you have organization that is put together, and the two drive each other. So I'm not sure it's a chicken and egg uh, question, and I'm not sure there is a, a very good answer to it. But the institutional side of it is what I worry about, because the institutional side has become so one-sided with the economy, the government structure, all of the key elements of the military, security services, judiciary, and even the ideology, uh, all put together in one institution. And there are two things that you can say about that. One, it's very hard to beat under those circumstances, and two, when it controls everything, it's almost certain to split at some point, that organizations that are that big tend to break up into pieces. Let's try and to get one or two more questions. And there was a woman at the extreme rear of the room. Please, go right ahead. Judith Kipper, uh, Gary and Abbas, nice to see you here. Kareem, I see you all the time. Um, one could come to the conclusion from what you've all said uh, that the uh, public negative pounding on Iran by the United States and Israel in particular, but uh, Europe as well, uh, is only fueling the fires of uh, all the negative uh, developments that you have seen. 
is it not true that at this moment, our lack of patience in observing what is a very dangerous, dynamic, historical transition in Iran, which may not come to a conclusion this year, next year, or, or even five years from now, may in fact be prolonging uh, the agony and that we ought to reevaluate at least our public diplomacy approach uh, to Iran, if not our actual policies toward Iran. Judith, I, uh, it's good to see you too. I don't think it's, it's been years and years. <clears throat> um, just one quick word, and that is I don't necessarily believe that our negative attacks and Israel's are really making things happen in Iran. I think what they're really doing is preventing us from taking opportunities as they come along. That, to me, is what we're really missing out on this whole thing. And that's very costly. Let's stay on that subject for a moment. What else, if anything, is the United States missing out on here? Uh, well, there are a couple of points that I want to make, both uh, addressing this issue and some of the issues that have been raised, I think the opposition is learning from other green movement, other um, movements. The leadership is very much in Iran, for example, uh, trying to set up a radio or a television that would be the spokesperson for the opposition. They're very much behind the effort uh, to lift some of the sanctions uh, about technologies and softwares that would allow the opposition to establish networks free from government uh, censorship. And in terms of, uh, you know, whether it's personal or uh, uh, institutional, uh, I just invite you to look at the institution of Basij. Uh, Basij was created as the most ideological institution. These were the people who would walk over minefields. Now, by every indication, has become inundated by opportunists who are there to get a job, to get their daughters in the university easier, to get a contract, to get... Uh, free uh, uh, medical. And uh, it reminds me, to go back to uh, Karim's point, it reminds me to, it reminds me of Communist League in Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s, a moribund institution filled with opportunists that was once the housing, uh, the center for uh, ideologues. And uh, uh, I think that nobody can accuse the United States or of Europe of having a prudent policy on Iran. It's been a long, long time since there has been a policy. I think the United States in specific, I think they have gone from one uh, initiative to another without having a strategic policy on what to do with Iran, where to go, and not allow the momentary lapses, uh, tactical lapses, to derail them. And the regime has been very, very effective in using this to its benefit. Kareem is our host. Why don't you take the last one? Uh, I think, Judith, that the, the, the challenge the Obama administration faces is one of competing timelines. We have this enormous sense of urgency because of the nuclear issue, and the leadership of the Green Movement doesn't have that same uh, sense of urgency. Um, they're taking a much more deliberate approach. They want to, uh, it's this almost like a rope-a-dope strategy of wearing down the regime over time and recruiting as many folks as possible under the umbrella of the Green Movement. And I know that they're frustrated with this sense of urgency from, from Washington. Uh, a friend of myself, an Abbas, um, uh, once said to me that, you know, a year ago the United States didn't even think we existed. And now, that they're, now they're looking at their watches impatiently and say, when are you going to change the regime for us? Um, the last m comment I would end on is, is about um, the Green Movement itself. And, you know, there's this phrase from, this adage from uh, U.S. politics that you, um, you uh, campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. And I think for the Green Movement to be successful, they're going to have to focus less on the poetry and more on the prose. Please join me in thanking our panelists today. <laughs> <laughs>